What's up, champs? Welcome to another episode of the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast, brought to you by Keeping Carlson. I'm Jeremy Versillo. Joining me tonight, my pal and yours, Shams Benamore. Shams, how are you doing on this fine Thursday evening? I'm doing okay. Just have to remind myself that it's American Thanksgiving tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but next week with uh, the only way that I have as a hint is just trying to understand uh, next week's schedule. So while we're going to be talking about this week, it's uh, going to be an interesting uh, weekend to listen to uh, Elon talk about matchup maximizer because there's just a mess of a schedule next week. Yeah, the schedule both this week and next week is a little bit wonky. Next week, there are 30 teams that play on Wednesday and 30 teams that play on Friday, but zero on Tuesday and Thursday. So that's weird. Get ahead of that if you're leading in your matchup. But actually, you mentioned this week's being a bit weird. That's our first topic of the day. Some of you may have noticed there was an 11 a.m. Pacific time, a 2 p.m. Eastern time game today, a Thursday. That's because it's the NHL Global Series and four teams are over in Sweden playing. I believe this includes an 8 a.m. Eastern game on Sunday. So make sure you're setting your lineups a day ahead. Hopefully it doesn't mess up your waivers at all, because it does in my league where waivers will process after that game starts. Uh, Yeah, I know a lot of people who missed some points from Ottawa and Detroit players because they did not realize there was an early game today. Especially if you're on the... uh more Western time zones as me. So that Sunday is, if you said it was eight Eastern, it's going to be 6 a.m. for me. So uh, just going to give you a heads up. I'm not going to be tweeting out the goalies for uh, that one. I'll be uh, still in bed. (laughs) That sounds like a good plan to me being in Pacific time. Let's jump right into some of the injuries and out juries as we always do. Timo Meyer is not playing tonight. Uh, Shams, what do you know about that injury? don't have the exact specifics, but the good news was is that he was a game-time decision today, so it doesn't seem anything long-term. So it's going to be something to just keep an eye on. And the the big thing is, is as uh, talks about on the the Sunday show, this is one of those ones where everyone gets degraded because, like, right now, the top six, even though they're winning 3-2, is Toffoli, McLeod, and Brat, and then Palat with Mercer and Holtz. So a lot of that firepower of uh, just kind of missing out there. So it's just going to be one of those situations that I know they had a decent schedule today, but or this week, and we'll have to see how you manage next week. But it's just going to be one of those everyone loses and just keep an eye out for when Meyer Hughes or uh, Ishir come back. But it's just kind of a bad day for all. It does look like they're beating the Penguins right now. Three to two lead. Eric Halla with uh, two points, one shorthanded. I guess you never know, but especially with Hughes and presumably Meyer looking to return soon, not a lot of actionable fantasy advice. You may pick someone up, and then they immediately go back to the third line. Another injury that happened last night, Andre Kuzmenko took a puck to the face, which, you know, you see more often than you should in the NHL. I really hate seeing that injury. And of course, he decides to tell reporters that he is fine. Uh, He'll miss Thursday's game, but it doesn't sound like anything long-term, like some of the really awful ones. But yeah, I'm fine is about the most hockey player response to taking a puck to the face you can think of. Oh yeah, it's just uh, amazing. It's anytime we uh, are talking on the Discord about, uh, on the live game chat channel, is that every, it feels like every 30 seconds passes, someone thinks, oh my, this person's injured. It's like, their knee just twisted it in an ungodly way, and then they're like, oh, they're out for the next line before they even finish sending out that message. Hockey players are just built differently. A bit crazy. We have some outcheries also. Anthony DeClaire is coming back. Uh, apparently, he came down with strep throat and lost about 10 pounds, but has gained most of it back. Your question is, do we care in our little note sheet here? I'm going to answer with no, because I didn't even know he was out. That's how much I paid attention to it. Oh, do you do you care about this one? So yeah, so I think people might be keeping an eye on him because of he's probably one of the more known names on that team. However, the big thing to keep in mind now, they didn't have a full squad on this practice, so you're gonna have to wait to see how tonight games go to have uh, more information. But Declare wasn't even on the top line while practicing, so he doesn't even get the exposure of hurdle. So that is really the big thing. So he might be one of the more known names, but I wouldn't be 
having interest in him depending on how deep your league is. To play a bit of devil's advocate, he probably is getting eased back in, especially if he lost 10 pounds in the last week. Additionally, his 5v5 shooting percentage is 3% right now uh, on ice, so that'll eventually come up no matter how bad the Sharks are. He's not going to rock one that low. I think he's got two goals for at 5v5 on ice and an expected goals for of like 6 or 6.5. So I think some better days are ahead, but I think he's only a deep league ad at this point. A guy who is hopefully coming back Friday that is much more relevant is Alex Tuck. This one's interesting because Tage Thompson just went out, so it looks like uh, Tuck, Skinner, and Cozens was the top line in practice. I'm not really worried about him falling out of that top six, but my my only thought is it's good to have him back. Exactly. It's going to be that situation of Cousins just kind of have to show up and then still have a Skinner there. And then the uh, just a little bit of an interesting thing is, is that the second line is middle stat with Paterka and Benson. So we'll have to see is that uh, there's no guarantee that Benson's going to stay up because I think he's only on like game eight or nine right now. But there is a potential that if uh, he lights it up a little bit more, that maybe he could be one that takes advantage of getting a top six spot with uh, Thompson out. He definitely could. The coach did say that they haven't decided whether they're sending him back to juniors or not. They already sent Matthew Savoy, who was further down the prospect depth chart, but on the same junior team, back. So I could see a benefit to sending Benson to play with his future teammate. We'll have to see how that one shakes out. For now, I'm not pre-adding Benson or anything, but keep an eye on him. One last Buffalo Sabre before we go to our ad break. Eric Comrie, the third goalie on Buffalo, was had a net to himself today at practice. Looks like he'll be back. I happen to have him on IR, so I'm hoping he gets a start Friday or Sunday. But this really just creates a problem for anybody who owns Buffalo goalies. They were already alternating Luconin and Levi. Adding Comrie in, even if it's not a straight 1-2-3 rotation, no goalie is even getting half the starts there. I think all goalies in Buffalo are droppable at this point. And with that, we're going to go to our ad break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. In the second half, we're going to go over some recent hot streaks we've been seeing. First one I'd like to mention is an interesting case of potentially a reversing top six in Calgary. The second line center, Nazem Kadri, has eight points and 23 shots in his last seven games. He's mostly playing with Connor Zeri and I don't know his first name, uh, Pospisil. Is that the first line in Calgary right now over Lindholm and Huberdeau? I definitely think you need to add Kadri in places he was dropped. He had some low percentages. I think we mentioned him on the show as a potential buy low or sneaky claim. Is it too spicy to want Kadri over someone like Lindholm or Huberdeau even? Um, maybe like... The way I look at it is I think it's like almost like a 1A and a 1B situation for the wrong reasons because neither of them are the greatest. Because if you look at the power play, it's Kadri with Zeri, and then the other two are the people on the other quote-unquote top line. It's uh, Lindholm and Ruzika. So I have a feeling it's going to be a mixture of those two that are the prominent. However, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I have really no interest in Huberto right now. If you just took off the name and looked at his stats, people wouldn't be talking about him. So I would definitely be more interested in Kadri than Huberto. And then it's maybe more of a toss up between Lindholm and himself. But the big thing is, is that I feel like in deeper leagues, like I ended up dropping Kadri in a 10-team league just because it's a 10-team league with uh, not that many people. But if you're in a deeper league, I feel like the Kadri does deserve to have to look at because he is producing and Zari seems like an interesting person. So he actually is paired with some skill. Totally. And especially in leagues where they count hits or penalty minutes, I think Kadri is a little bit above your average forward there. Calgary's not a bad team. They aren't very good in the standings, but I fully expect they will score some goals. They'll have some points. I'm not giving up really on anybody in that uh, first power play unit, at least. Maybe not the whole top six. I don't really know anything about 
Pospisil and Zeri has his usual rookie problems, even though he looks really promising. Uh, it's an interesting team to have some stake in right now, for sure. Another guy who's kind of been a bit underwhelming to start the season, at least in my opinion, is Zach Warinski. But he is on a three-game point streak. He's been shooting at least twice per game. I think he only has two games the whole season with less than two shots. Do you think Warinski is running a bit cold and due for a few more points, or is he about right right now? I think the, my concern is with Warinski is more with the team than himself, is that if you looked at the lines this week, or at least uh, this game, it's just kind of a mess of just them putting line A in different parts, like Right now, Boone Jenner is with like two random players of like not having any Gaudreau or like any exposure to like their top players. So right now, my question more is a concern about just their overall offense. Because if I remember right now, I believe they're losing three one to Arizona right now. So it's just that situation of like I hate it. Like Redsky has the skill; he has showed it. It's just that depending on just the depth of your team or whatnot, is that he doesn't do a lot of the peripherals. So while that's nice, it's only nice if he gets points, and I'm just afraid that this team is just not getting points in general. I actually think he's due to be in on a few more points. He doesn't have a single power play point this year, despite the fact that Columbus's power play has been eh. I mean, it's been okay. He shouldn't have zero. He's also shooting only 2.7%, which is lower than his 7.1% career mark. Uh, he's usually one of those defensemen you can expect to score 12 to 15 goals in a season, kind of like uh, Jacob Chikrun and Shea Theodore. So I'm hoping he puts some goals in and gets some power play points, and those season-long averages jump right back up. Another hot streak, Evander Kane, has a lot of points recently. He scored a hat trick last night against the Kraken and is doing his usual Evander Kane hit-and-shot thing. Actually, he's doing more than his usual. He is on pace for over 300 hits this year, like Brady to Chuck type numbers. I don't think that part is sustainable, but he may be dragging himself back into the equation in Edmonton, even though they still refuse to put him on the top power play. I, uh, well, when you're with uh, Dreisaitl and Hyman on 5v5, you're basically on a power play whenever you're just like playing at even strength, so... While it'd be nice to be have that power play one with those line mates, I don't care. <laughs> That's very true. Edmonton often looks like they're on the power play on 5v5 with either of those top two units out there. A couple guys that may be potential breakouts or second half stars that are like showing some real signs of life. Uh, Cole Perfetti has four goals and seven assists in his last 10 games, including a seven game point streak. He started to shoot a little more over that time. I know he was a big scorer coming into the league, but was averaging less than two shots a game and has started to drag that up over his last 10. His time on ice total is pretty low, but he's playing power play one. And his even strength numbers may be due for a bit of a boost when Velarde comes back and replaces Nemestikov as his center. Only downside is that he's almost a complete zero on peripherals. He has a single hit and three blocks in 15 games on the season. I think a big thing with this is just kind of where you feel about your forwards in general. So say if you're in a situation where you have maybe a good row or a Huberto that's uh, not doing anything and you're looking at dropping people, this could be a person that can fit in. Because like, I am pretty interested in Perfetti, but my problem was is that looking at my lineups, I would not be able to fit him until, say, maybe this game today or next week on Sunday. So really what it is, is just looking at how you feel about your overall forwards. And then if you have a spot that you can actually fit him in, I definitely would be of the mind to give him that test drive, see how it goes. And then if it keeps on going, keep him around. But it's just that difficulty of just finding where to fit him in your lineups. If you had the roster spot, would you rather Perfetti or our next young potential breakout guy, Owen Tippett? Owen Tippett has just been always kind of that interesting player ever since that uh, Drew trade that brought him to um, the Flyers. Now, the question is, is that while I am a big fan of just of Tippett with his shots, 
and he's getting the goals here and there, I believe. Yeah, he has four goals or yeah, four goals and five points in the last three games. My question is, is that I would probably lead just Perfetti because he has more of a role in there because the Flyers just love to mix up their lines. And then also in the end, I would say that Winnipeg is a better team than Philly. But in the end, is that if I didn't have Perfetti as an option, I would not scoff at trying to play with uh, Tippett. I really like Tippett for the long term. And actually, I may like him a bit better than Perfetti just because he actually hits a bit and he shoots more consistently. I've had my eye on Tippett for a few years now in Keeper and Dynasty Leagues as a guy who's going to be a future volume shooter. And when you shoot that much, you're probably scoring 30 goals. I also really like the fact that Tippett has so much room for his deployment to improve that if he jumps from 15 minutes a night to 18 minutes a night, those goal and assist numbers are really going to pop. I'm not sure if it's going to happen this year. I know in the short shift chat, like 10 minutes ago, we were talking about, well, what happens when Philly trades everything that's not nailed to the floor? And there's a chance that if they trade some guys up in front of him, he could end up playing first or second line and getting some more power play time. I uh, really like Owen Tippett. I would take him over Perfetti. Yeah, it's the really big dance in that situation is just the coaching. I feel like the coaching in Philly wants to have split deployment. They want to play like, say, a Carolina or a Seattle, even if they don't have the players to do it. So that would be my concern is that like if they were just playing their best guys at the time, I would be with you that with the shooting volume and whatnot, it's just I need to see, and this is maybe where I'm going to miss out because someone's going to add it before it happens. I need to see that time on ice increase before I project it myself. I can see that argument. I agree that Tortorella is very much a, you will play the same amount as our other lines and you will play defensively responsibly and stop trying to score goals. We're going to win this game 2-1 type of coach. We have one more I'll call it a hot streak to talk about, but I believe this is a why are we talking about this guy type of player. Why don't you tell us what John Marino has been doing lately and whether or not it's relevant? This is just another story in my line of all defensemen are weird on points because I don't think anyone was thinking about drafting John Marino. I had to kind of remind myself that he actually plays for the, and I actually pause there I just because I want to say Pittsburgh, but he's not there anymore. He's with the Devils and he's just getting somehow has a goal and seven assists in the last 10 games. But like the oddest thing is, is that he literally has five shots and three hits to go along with that. So it's just kind of one of those situations of just a player being in the right place at the right time, but somehow doing it across 10 games. So depending on how you go, like, Maybe if you just want to ride the wave in a points only league, that might be something just knowing that it could dry up at any point. Like I haven't looked at today's game stats. He might probably be a straight zero or he could have three assists and a goal. Like it's just that kind of roll the dice. And let's just say it could be loaded to state guys a little bit more than you'd want it to be. (laughs) I just, while you were talking, looked up today. He has played 21 minutes and 19 seconds with a couple minutes left in the game. But his stat line is three blocks. No shots, no hits, no points. It's, uh, even though the team scored five goals, I think John Marino is a dart throw that you should not be adding. And I feel like I'm just stating the obvious here. Like, he's lucked into those assists. I don't think he's an offensive play driver. He may play with guys who are play drivers, but that's just going to give him random secondary assist spurts like this one. It just happened to have go, go along a bit longer than expected. Last but not least, another guy who may have just had a really long secondary assist spurt that is a bit of a snoozer here. Who are you dropping, Shams, even though he had a point today, I believe? Uh, It's the old uh, short shift bump before we even record, is that this is kind of a snoozer alert because I actually had him on my team. Um, Ivan Provorov, and this is not including today's stats because... but uh, he's averaging 2.43 kakuffle points in the last four days. And in the last seven games, 
uh, this month, not including today. He only eclipsed two cacuffle points twice. And then just for the people that are not into cacuffle, you get a half point for a shot and a half point for a block. So, like, basically he's saying that in those games that he was only getting maybe two shots and two blocks, which is not worth a roster spot. And the reason I'm bringing this up because, sure, he might be on the ice a lot. The big thing that surprised me is that um, this is using yesterday's data is that he's in 87% of cacuffle divisions. And that is just a number way too high. Like, for example, if we looked at like, I'm not saying John Marino's an ad, but like John Marino is doing infinitely better than Provorov. So if you don't think that John Marino is an ad and we would agree with you, that means that we do not think Provorov is an ad because he's not giving you the peripherals that often, or at least enough to matter. And then he's not getting the points. He may get an assist today, but that's the idea is that this is like his third assist in the month. And this is like eight games in. So I need a lot more peripherals to be living off of three assists in a month. To be fair to the patrons here, Columbus did have a four game week last week and a four game week this week. So I'm going to assume that that entire 87% is rostering him as a streamer and will drop, be dropping him on Monday when Columbus does not have a game and the good stretch is over. Yes, thank you for bringing that up because the big thing that this is why I am on my platform of you do not need four defensemen in points leagues is because all games played are not the same because we do have the stats that more games played will put you in a position to more likely win games, but those points do matter of where they're coming from. I would much rather take three games of a red forward Say if you had Tippett on your wire or even someone worse than Tippett, I would much rather get two or three games of him than four games of Provorov. You most likely, more times than not, get more cacuffle points at the end of the week by doing that, just taking the quote-unquote games played route and having Provorov on your team. Totally agreed. I know it's been actually really tough with how the schedule's been this first half of the season, but going into the second half, when the NHL actually starts scheduling American games on Sunday because the NFL isn't playing, we will have a bit more balanced of an off day schedule. And that will make a big difference for being able to, you know, run three defensemen and just stream an extra forward to get the better games played, as you put it. I agree with that strategy. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to give us a follow at Short Shifts KK as well as Brian and Elon at Keeping Carlson. Please use www.gamedaytweets.com to get all the best info from Twitter without having to slog through the rest of that place, including team-by-team and searchable tweets by player name. Visit that site and the other great sites we use to research our episodes with at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, ShiftChart.com, Icy Data, and Natural Stat Trick. Our intro and outro music was created by Pat Roach, and John Reed is our digital media producer. Until we see you next time, play smart and keep your shifts short. 